So hi guys, one more time to Quantum Society, one more uh, QS meetings. Today we are with a really uh, interesting guy, he's Oliver, his name is Oliver Diamond. Hi guys, uh, nice that I can uh, join a Quantum Society for this uh, interview with uh, Manu. And today we are going to have a really, really interesting interview because this guy went to space in a Blue Origin a spacecraft with uh, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. So I think it's going to be really cool and a lot of questions, you know, uh, is the Earth flat? <laughs> it's how it feels in, with zero gravity, things like uh, that. So let's start. But uh, before we go, um, I like I would like to Oliver to introduce yourself uh, a little if you want. Right. Hey, I'm uh, I'm Oliver. I'm now 19 years old. I'm a pilot and now an astronaut. Uh, last year, I'm studying physics and astronomy in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, it's in the center of the Netherlands. Furthermore, I fly a lot, uh, I do kite surfing, I like uh, physics, of course, and everything that, that has to do with it. And uh, I live with Manu uh, in Spain uh, for a bit, so that's how we uh, know each other. Um, and I lived in Spain to get my pilot license. Exactly. So, uh, that's Malaga, it. Good, good accommodation. Yeah, we, we spent some nights uh, talking about the space, the stock exchange also, and what more? Physics in general, right? Veritasium channel, quantum society. Yeah. You gave me some advice uh, and I took really, you know, uh, important ones. So thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, are you ready? We, we can start yeah. you, when you want. Are you excited? Yeah, let's go. Hit me. Okay. Let's go. I will hit you. <laughs> so, well, uh, you said something about your um, pilot license in Malaga, right? Um, uh, this was during your gap year uh, after high school. And when did you start your passion for space? And did this pilot license has, have something uh, to do with this passion for space? I think a uh, passion for space and uh, flying is fairly close. I've been generally interested in um, engineering and in astrophysics and in everything that has to do with the both of it. And of NASA. course, space and flying is the perfect, um, are the perfect combinations. Also with the adrenaline of being able to fly your own plane and the freedom and being able to, to do anything you want. But also with the mechanical parts, you have to learn about uh, how to build a plane and how to maintain it. And uh, it's also super interesting because they're pretty complicated systems. And it's always, um, it's the like the little brother of the uh, space um, industry. I think most people that are interested in uh, aviation are also uh, quite some space uh, enthusiasts as well. But um, space is for me, has always been my main, main goal in life to be able to go there. But didn't expect to uh, go this early at uh, just 18 years old. I was a big fan of Thunderbirds and all those skit series where it's about space. And I watched at quite a young age already um, all these Star Trek episodes and you get so amazed. Although it's quite science fiction, but it still it gets you interested in these unknown things, which are fiction, but they're also related to the reality, which is that there's so much that there's not known yet about outer space and about all that stuff. Uh, which gets you interested in it. And that's, I think, started at quite a young age and just grows and grows on you. It's interesting that all physicists that I know, each day even more, uh, they all love a Star Trek. I've never watched any film, so I, I will have to do it. I mean, it's a must now. Yeah, <laughs> I will. I will, for sure. Okay, so, uh, and what was your first thought when you received that offer to go? Because I will let you know this, okay? I, I was looking at Instagram, the typical thing, and... Suddenly it was ah, a new picture of Oliver, like, but then I say thousand likes, what the fuck? Blue Origin, what the fuck is going on here? Literally it was like that. What did you feel? I mean, how was your Yeah, it was quite sudden, um, just because we were, it was for a bit for the seat, uh, for charity. Me and my dad joined that bid, but uh, it went to uh, a man in China yep. uh, for $28 million, I think. But so it was crazy but i was was in contact with uh, blue origin um because i was a pilot and i was yeah. um just 18 years old at the moment and i really liked it and i was also interested in physics and i was interested in space and i knew a lot about it and i talked with a few people from blue origin and um then at one point um just two three weeks before the flight the man who won the bids uh, couldn't go then they called me 
um, like literally two weeks before the flight. <laughs> is there a, is there a possibility you could come to the US and uh, still uh, fly with us on the first uh, human flight? And I was like, well, that possibility is there for sure. <laughs> so I uh, changed throughout my whole schedule. Uh, it was quite hard to get in the U U uh, USA because of COVID. Yeah, COVID, yeah. I see. No one could come in. So um, it was a lot of work with the embassies and to get into the United States itself. Harder to get into the United States than to get into space. <laughs> oh, gee, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was really hard. I mean, yeah. I know people even with visa and work yeah. there couldn't go. You can't imagine the feeling when you're like, when you're like hearing on the phone, like, yeah, you can come here to the United States and go to space. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't imagine. Man. Okay, okay. So was there ever a time before or during the launch where you really, you know, you were really afraid of? man, I'm gonna die today. I mean, something could go wrong or you were like, ah, you know, screw it, let's do it. To this be honest, fine. there was not a single second of fear. There was just so much excitement and there's just this ultimate goal to go to space. Okay. And when you have that in front of you, you just don't think about the risks or what could happen. And it was the 16th flight of the vehicle and they there were no incidents or anything. It felt pretty secure. Uh, it was the first human flight, of course, but there were many flights before it. And I spoke with a lot of the engineers and I spoke with uh, all the people who built it. And they, of course, already knew a bit how rockets work and stuff, but they explained how much safety um, yep. there is on this specific rocket because it's meant to carry humans. So that's for every single system, there's two or three backups, if not more. Yeah, okay, okay. So, so there, there were uh, like a plan B, right? If something... Yeah, plan B, plan C, plan D, <laughs> until Z and goes back yeah. <laughs> to the Greek alphabet. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, really, really cool then. Oh, uh, now about feelings. I mean, can you describe your feelings and thoughts exactly during that zero gravity effect that was like some seconds, right? I mean, or minutes? Or yeah, it was three minutes. About it was fairly short, of course, but uh, it was a parabolic flight. But then uh, at a hundred kilometers high. So we went uh, up, it was three minutes till uh, main engine cut off. And uh, from that point that you don't have to boost from the engine, which uh, accelerates you. So you get pushed into your seat, you're released and you are in zero G. Okay. And that's just, if, I don't know. It's so the hard magic. to describe. You just the magic appears. <laughs> just the ultimate relaxation feeling. It's quite fun. I watched this video of, um, of how how they thought uh, before people went to space yep what it would be like because they knew there was zero g or there was uh zero g and um, they thought that people would get into a a, a stress uh, situation because they thought it would feel like the continuous uh falling like you would the the effect you have when you fall that you had that continuously when you would go in zero g but that's obviously not the case which is super relaxed and just everything just feels so smooth and it's so nice to be able to experience that but also with the views of the earth and um and everything else and, and the rest of the the crew what about the rest of the crew they were like also relaxed as you or some neither of no no like uh i was with wally funk she's 82 years old she's a super aviator has an enormous amount of hours in planes and did everything you're able to do in a plane that's possible so she was not afraid at all and then Mark and uh, Jeff, the two brothers, they were just super tough and um, they didn't have any feelings of, uh, we, at least not that I noticed. <laughs> okay, okay. But they were not afraid. Okay, really cool. And okay, of course you, you have windows there. I mean, little windows, but you, you could see what was going on. Well, at the moment, uh, we're the biggest windows ever in space. Really? Yeah. So at least you, you could see something, right? You could see the air. Yeah, you could see quite much. You see, see the curvature. And so you were about, uh, we went up to 107 kilometers. So you can see the entire earth, but you could see like very clear, like the flatlands, then like this thin blue layer, which is the atmosphere, of course. Atmosphere, yeah. And then the full blackness of space. Oh, really cool. So the diffraction is not affecting yeah. there. I mean, there is no more. No, no, you're fully out of that. Oh, atmosphere. really cool. I'm going to ask you as an astronaut, the, the Earth is not flat, isn't it? <laughs> right? No, no, no. Would be cool uh, if I could say that it was flat, but no. Okay. Sorry, guys. 
it's not. <laughs> Some people in my team were like, imagine he said that it, it, it's flat. <laughs> would be really cool. I mean, at least. Nah, yeah, you could definitely see the curvature. Okay. I still can't imagine all that. That's quite quite a group of people that still thinks that the Earth is flat. <laughs> so how do you think space travel can be made compatible with sustainability of the earth? Of course, reusable rockets was a, was a big thing. It was really important to get that as a standard and it's being standardized now. There's still some rockets that are not being reused, but that just tends this uh, against those others. But what they're doing now is the difference between also Blue Origin and uh, SpaceX is that Blue Origin um, is doing these manned flights with the uh, new Shepard rocket, which I was on, but it's on hydrogen. And uh, of course, hydrogen is sustainable and um, it costs way less uh, CO2 to uh, to make. Uh, not to make, that of course, that can cost CO2, but you can, you're able to do it fully uh, on green energy. And that's of course with a methane fuel, which uh, most rockets use nowadays, it's not possible. And I think it's also not realistic, uh, the view of uh, Elon Musk um, to be flying so much Falcons and so much rockets on methane and keeping the methane flow going. Because of course, space is going to expand. And if he says, yes, I want to, I want to do a, <laughs> a traveling agency, which gets you from Hong Kong to, um, to Sydney in 30 minutes with, uh, with rockets on methane. Yeah. That's not uh, sustainable at yeah, all, of course. I, I understand. Would you like them to work in the space industry? I mean, you, you were talking about NASA, of course, it's a huge, uh, I mean, the bureaucracy is huge, but of course, NASA probably, I think for you and me, is like. The first thing that you think about yeah. when you are a child, right? So wh where do you think force, uh, forces should be concentrated and should be public, private or hybrid efforts? That's a good question. Of course, what I just said, the point of having uh, private companies work on stuff is that it's more, most of the times it's cheaper to have a, a private company work on it than to have a, a government company work on it. But I think the hybrid combination uh, should still be there. Yep. because there should be regulation and there should be accountability for who sends what to space because in the history you could send everything to space that you wanted it doesn't matter but now there's getting so much satellites and everyone's in on it and there should be regulation and it should be kept up and if you give it fully uh, privatized rights then it will be hard to sustain but with also with blue origin with my flight blue origin was is has been stated by FAA, the um, yep. Flight Regulation Office of uh, the USA, uh, which also does uh, space regulation now. Uh, they did full uh, own uh, examination of if it was safe. FAA like could say like, okay, yeah, you have to do this and this. Yeah. Well, it was mostly full your their own respons responsibility to get it safe, which of course will change in the future. Uh, but uh, yeah, for the first few stuff, um, it's still well West uh, out there now. Okay. So um, this basically is the last question is about, you know, we are going from the Earth to the space. And now what about the, the Mars and the Moon? Uh, would you like to be one of the first men in, you know, mankind to go there and conquer those exotic lands? Or would you like to say, ah, well, it's, that was enough? <laughs> well, of course, as an, uh, if you seek to explore going to Mars, the ultimate way to go and uh it would be super cool to see that and to see those landscapes and to be able to really build something there one day but to really be the first one and not being able to go back to earth for a couple of years probably the first time or, or never, never. <laughs> yeah. the most probably is that never but <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh right, right. that's still pretty insane uh, thought yeah, it, yeah well you'll yeah. see I think, uh, I think there's going to be some brave people out there that's going to conquer uh, Mar Mars. I'm, I'm sure. You, you know what Elon Musk used to say about, if, you know, if he wanted to go to space, to, to Mars, sorry, for in the first flight, he answered, I want to die in Mars, but not just in impact. I mean, I, I don't <laughs> want to die in the rocket. So he doesn't trust a lot on his technology. I mean, uh, me neither. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. one thing is here on Earth where you can see everything. And another thing is, a planet that, you know, some storms last for, I think, six months, man. But yeah. with, with lightnings, I mean, <laughs> a thunderstorm, so. Yeah, there's not, there's a quite a different uh, circumstances there, yeah. Exactly. Here you have some rainy, the, the day is rainy and you, you stop the launching. It's, ah, no launching today. There you yeah, have to, you know. Imagine, imagine what, how cool it would be to be the person to see those places and those 
hills and craters and everything as well really as the first cool. and to really be able to research it because of course you have quite a lot of rovers on uh, on mars now and i've been sending them for quite a few years basically uh i don't know we, we have learned a lot of things i've learned a lot of things i also love space i'm in physics also and with a lot of models on astrophysics so i think we have a really related background as i say maybe i will have the first me uh, massage <laughs> up there let's see <laughs> uh, you, yeah. you can interview me if i do it yeah okay? we'll do we'll do okay okay so oliver thank you very much for coming it was really cool really interesting and you know also to uh know about you about uh, after one year so i hope you enjoyed also as well yeah sure thank you for inviting me and i hope the quantum uh, society is growing and growing also to the international uh, community Let's go, what we can achieve, okay? So guys, this is Quantum Society, your science and technology community, and see you in the next video. See you soon.